Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. I'm Whitney, host of the Real Estate Syndication Show. Every day I'm interviewing experts that will help you to successfully invest in or grow your syndication business. Hit the like and subscribe button so you'll be on track to learn from the best in the industry. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Mike Zlotnick. Mike has been on the show a couple other times. I encourage you to listen to show 130. I can't hardly believe it's a thousand shows ago. And also show 539. Uh, and we've talked about numerous things, but uh, he is a very experienced fund manager. And we talk about different aspects of managing funds. Uh, and today we're talking about something a little different, but a little bit about him in case you have not heard of him before or didn't listen to those shows. Uh, he's been a debt and equity investor in real estate since 2000. He started his career and it's been nearly 15 years in the information technology technology field, managing risk, business intelligence, and quality of complex system software and processes. In 2009, Mike joined Tempo Funding LLC as a managing partner and vice president of funding operations. And starting from January 2014, Mike has assumed the responsibility as a CEO and since founding a Tempo Funding Management Group, LLC, launching three new real estate investment funds. Uh, and so I encourage you to reach out to Mike, especially if you are interested in funds and, and even listening to those other shows to, to learn about how he is operating funds. Uh, but today we talk about a, a project he's doing in New York City, but then we we spend the majority of the time talking about even hotel conversions. And, and he is uh, just creating some great opportunities in that niche. It's, it's kind of a, a, a niche that's getting a lot bigger now, right? Uh, more active, more people getting into that since the pandemic. And so I think he's going to mention many things about hotel conversions that uh, whether you're a passive investor or whether you're an active operator, you're going to learn a lot and that you're going to need to know. Mike, welcome back to the show. I, I've, I've enjoyed us catching up a few times. I know I was on your show and, and you've been on twice in the past, I think, which isn't very common on our show. But man, you are doing some big stuff in this business and there's uh, some specific things you're working on. I want us to be able to highlight today. I know you came on first as show 130. And that seems like forever ago. That was actually a thousand shows ago, uh, nearly. And so, Mike, welcome back. Why don't you give us a little update on some things you're working on right now? Uh, and let's jump in. Thank you. We very much appreciate the opportunity to be on the show. And I bow to you for your ability to run the show. I think you do it every day, which is very hard. I only do one episode a week. You're doing five and it's yeoman's work. It's hard though. So anyway, I appreciate being on the show. Just a couple of quick updates. What's going on right now, working on a really exciting deal here in New York City, partnering up with basically the gentleman who we've invested with. He does distress that in New York and through distress that he got a unique opportunity to get basically 20 apartment complex in Manhattan on, on East 73rd Street. But this used to be a single family townhouse. And we kind of went to the conversation. We realized this is a phenomenal opportunity. And uh, to make a long story short, now we're working to redevelop it back as a townhouse. It's 35 feet wide townhouse that is about 17,000 square feet. So if you can imagine New York City, 35 feet wide, it's got substantial depth. And so what's unique about it and what's so excited about it, exciting about it, it's going to be one of the top 10 townhouses on the east side. And it's only going to cost, that's it, not, 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 not a big number, you know, New York City townhouse, what, is it, what do you think it's going to cost? Do you have an idea what a fully redeveloped down to the beams, top of, by the way, we're we partnering up with top name developer, top name architect, their requirements. So what do you think a product like this could cost in New York? I really have no idea, but if I was going to guess, four seventy-five. No, I meant maybe I'm maybe six hundred thousand. Six hundred thousand. Six hundred thousand in New York City, Manhattan. You can't get a closet for that money. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. I don't know anything about New York City. Educate me, Mike. Yeah, sure. But the funny thing is, you said six hundred seventy-five thousand. Of course, in New York City, it's impossible. It's going to be between sixty-five to seventy million dollars. Oh, I was thinking per unit, but. Uh... I didn't think about the whole the whole complex. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be no more uh, twenty apartments. It's going to be one single family residential townhouse. Uh, essentially, your massive wow factor it will be designed by a famous architect. Will be executed by a strong developer in New York. 
And it, it's an exciting project because it, it does have history. This, this building had some famous actors. Even a prince uh, was a prince who lived in this house. Uh, Prince of Monaco or something like that. <laughs> so years ago, and there's very limited supply of them, especially 35 feet wide. You can imagine 20 feet, 18 feet, it's very hard to have great living, but in a 35 feet wide townhouse, you can have a phenomenal living room, dining room. So very excited working on this project. We're going to be all in about $40 million. It's, it's, a, wow. it's an acquisition of about 23 million bucks, 14 million development on a single house. And then, so of course, of course, so 40 million, 40 million all in, and then 65 to 70, hopefully sale in three to four years. Wow. So have you done other projects in this market or is this a market, you know, or have known for a while? Right. So that's, that's a great question. And, and normally we don't do that. Like New York city, we don't do these, these, these type of projects. I call them very speculative projects. It's a, there's a lot of risk, but the reward is pretty strong. So we, we did a institutional waterfall in the deal, the target returns between 25 to 30% annually IRR. Uh, what, what we're doing in this, we're partnering with people who have done a lot, right? Yeah. So this, this famous architect, famous developer, and then Eric is the other partner and me, essentially. And I have a podcast style that's coming out on this uh, with Eric. I, I, I don't have experience personally being a developer in New York City. I live here. I invest, I invest but I, I'm not a developer per se. So all I do is raise capital. We deploy the projects. This particular project uh, is not yet our typical wheelhouse. The typical wheelhouse, just to give you an update, what else we're doing? We're continuously investing more and more into the hotels, the multifamily conversions. We have probably up to you know close to a dozen in the portfolio. We have three exits this quarter in Temple Grove Fund. Basically, fascinating exits. So, talking about opportunities, things have worked out. So, you can't compare. These are very different projects. But what's in need today? Affordable housing, right? Workforce housing. And we've been investing very heavily in that sector. You are a multifamily guru. You know how these projects are. If you can have a affordable housing project, they fly off the shelf. So we did our first exit this quarter, which basically was an investment in September of last year. We put a million bucks from a Temple Grove fund into total equity of a million and a half. We took about two thirds of the equity. All in, total redevelopment to multifamily was about $6 million in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. This thing was supposed to sell in five years for about 8 million bucks, right? So you get 2 million in equity upside on a million and a half investment in five years, whatever target return is like 20%. Well, it looked all good on paper about a year ago. Now we just exited. Well, don't fall off the chair because it exited instead of eight for 10 and a quarter, talking about the market and a good execution, 13 months, it exited for 10 and a quarter. And the IRR, we, we got back essentially when a million invested 2.6 in 13 months. Wow. It, whatever the IRR comes up to be about 140%, right? So that is a hot sector. So we, the, from the project's perspective, these redevelopments, especially extended state hotels to multifamily, is flying off the shelf. We have another one exiting uh, probably in December of uh, our Ramada Inn. So it's, it's a little different. This was a residence inn that I mentioned first and then Ramada Inn. They look like studios. I mean, you can imagine what Ramada rooms look like, right? This Ramada is exiting in Mesa, Arizona. It's exiting where in about 18 months with about 2X multiple. So we're going to double the money in 18 months. I think it's like 60% IRR. It's, 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 massively under, it's massively lagging the 140%. It's still a home run, still a massive home run. So these are some of the exits, Temple Grove Fund, early exits that we are observing. And I'm almost shocked. We weren't planning for anything to exit for at least two years. We've got three exits this quarter in essentially between 13 months, 18 months, and 21 months. It's too fast. Mike, uh, speak to uh, hotel conversions a little bit. I mean, what does that process look like a little bit? And for the past investor listening, uh, maybe some things they need to know when they're considering uh, investing with an operator that's doing hotel conversions. Sure. So hotel conversions, as easy as it sounds, does take work. So we invest only with the institutional quality operator. They do many of them. It, it takes a ton of experience. Obviously, number one, zoning and entitlements. So if you're looking at a potential property under ideal circumstances, you want to find that the property is located on land that is naturally permitted or uh, allowed for a multifamily. If you can't do that, then you have to go to the zoning board and see what's the appetite and the interest for a conversion of a hotel to multifamily. 
If local zoning board is excited about it, if they would love to have more workforce housing, then you have potentially a good project. Obviously, economics have to work. So you have to be all in typically cost versus the future value. And the future value is determined based on your traditional multifamily cap rate approach. So if you are a multifamily investor and you're comfortable with those type of assets, what is the end product will look like? What kind of apartments, what they can rent for? And if you establish the value, how cheaply can you get in? If you can get in under 75% of the future value, that's a decent setup. At the end of the day, it, 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 the underwriting has to be conservative and you have to be very comfortable in the execution, uh, given what's going on with the current heavy inflation environment on the labor and materials and the supply chain broken, right? So your ability to execute is going to make a big difference. The heavier the project, the greater the risk. Extended hotel, extended stay hotels into multifamily where there's, it, they look like apartments already. Those are the easy lifts. The, the harder lifts is the ones that you have to be comfortable with. So key piece of the due diligence is what can you execute the construction at what cost and what time and what are the risks you're going to get stuck without some critical supply, supply chain item. Are you about to start a podcast or producing a podcast and tired of doing the editing yourself? We have produced over 1,000 daily shows and the production team that I've created They're now available to produce shows for you as well. We can do as little or as much as you need from finding and communicating with guests, preparing introductions, to editing the audio and video. You will sound better, have a more professional presence, and be able to spend your time doing other valuable tasks on your business. Let me know you're interested by emailing me directly at Whitney at LifeBridgeCapital.com. Everybody says, you know, conservative underwriting, but when looking at hotel conversions, what are a couple of things that maybe the past investor should ask about so they know that it actually is conservative underwriting when we're talking about hotel conversions? Sure. So I would say in the underwriting process, I always think about three things. Number one is who is the operator? Like you, you can't even talk about the numbers. If the operator has a ton of come, how many projects like this have you done, right? If you've got dozens of them and you've got a strong team that knows this stuff, that's a not guarantee a success, but a strong, a strong starting point. Obviously, a referral, right? You could have somebody claiming that they are a specialist and then they, they blow their own horn. Do the due diligence. Make sure you somehow establish their credibility and, and get referrals and feel confident that that operator knows what they're doing, which is a critical piece. And then two, obviously, you go into financial underwriting. So the financial, the asset level underwriting, you have to look at you know what's the most important metric in multifamily on these value add projects, develop and redevelop. What's the number one metric? And in my view, it's post renovation rent. What rent can you achieve? Right? Can you be realistic on these rents? We are in a heavy inflationary environment, obviously. So you can't assume this is going to continue. You have to go back, revert to the mean. What has been the average historic rate of appreciation, or or, or the rent increases in that area? Right. So as long as you can get comfortable with the future rents, then you can get comfortable with the whole model. If the the rents are very optimistic for this type of product, that's a risk. If the rents are very realistic, so typically they develop into a studio or one one bedroom, a small one bedroom, compared to the similar product after the redevelopment, what is it rent for? Can you get to the right number? If you can, that's one of the key underwriting. We, we, We kind of, if we can't get there, nothing else matters. Then you look at the area, you look at, at basically kind of trends. Is this a good area? Is this an improving area? The rent's going up because something else is happening in the area. You could actually justify rents that are substantially higher than the current rents. If you can see, you know, Toyota is moving in and they're going to open a big plant nearby and you feel, you know, th- 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 there are other factors that can, ju- that can drive the, the decision. But I would say that's a key, key metric. And obviously cost. You look at the pro forma, what are they going to spend on the construction? Can you get comfortable with these numbers? Maybe talk to the sponsor and say, how are you going to deal with, with the you know, inflation on the materials? By the way, just one really important comment. As I've been thinking through these, pro- through these projects, I compare three types of multifamily projects, right? One called hotel to multifamily conversion. Two, value-add multifamily. So value-add multifamily classic. If you buy something you know, underperforming rents below the market, then you value-add internal, external renovations, and then increased rent. And the third is a ground up, right? The three different projects. And people ask me, well, you know, what do you think about all three? 
this is really important because you, you're comparing to something that, that's got two other kind of methodologies. How do you get into multifamily? And they're very different. One of the major strengths of hotel redevelopment versus the others, ground up takes substantially longer, right? Whoever's going to tell you they're going to do a ground up all in for two, within two years, that's wonderful. It's possible. But the delays could drag you easily into three years. The delayed uh, time and the cost overruns, the risk on a ground up is a lot higher. Then you have the value adds. The value adds, they're wonderful. The cash flow from day one, hopefully, right? The problem is you can only renovate on turn unless you're going to start kicking people out. So your time for innovation is just going to take longer. You can get to your stabilization point after innovation, but it takes two, two and a half, three years, normally on a value, you know, on a value of multifamily. Now you look at the hotel to multifamily conversion. It's empty. You just execute. You just do it. You can actually get there within a year, okay, 18 months, the longest. So one of the major benefits is if you execute it right, you can have a finished product a lot faster. So uh, I, I've looked at number of, again, we're fund to funds. We invest in a bunch of deals and I deal with sponsors all day long. And I've compared a lot of value on multifamilies versus the hotel to multifamily conversions. And you can actually get a little bit more aggressive in the underwriting of hotel to multifamily because you get there faster. So your refi event happens faster or your sale event happens faster. You know, you spoke about like the inflation of materials and maybe the, the, the fear of a lack of materials at times as well. I get that question often about, from investors. Uh, what's a backup plan? I guess for you all, if we can't get materials or just planning for inflation on materials. So that's a great question. You got some really interesting kind of flavors of this, what I've seen happening. One is in some of these projects, again, hotel to multifamily conversions, they start operating them as a hotel and they keep running the thing as a hotel for as long as they can. So if you have a backup plan where you don't have to you know, turn off the whole thing overnight, you can do it in sections. I've seen hotels that they have separate buildings, especially garden style hotels. Then you can start converting and operating the hotel at the same time. At that point, if you have delays in the conversion, you can still keep the lights on through the execution of a, of a hotel operation. So it, it's a risk mitigation. We don't know if materials are stuck delayed and you're working one of the four buildings. Again, the garden style hotel, for example. Uh, one is stuck, you don't start the other ones. It's one of the mitigation strategies. I mean, the other stuff is obviously a competent operator with a strong supply chain. Again, everybody is now competing for the materials uh, and for the labor. Typically, the more competent operator wins because they can secure the, the materials and the product and they can pay people a little more. So it, it's, it's, it's a risk and a known and your level of comfort with whoever you're investing with, can they you know, up to, up, up source the materials? It, 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 it's for sure a risk, something to be very well aware. And you can ask the operator, how do you get materials? How do you know you will get the materials when you need them? And I've seen different answers. Some people we invest with, they have massive warehouses and they do multiple projects in the same city. They buy a whole lot of stuff in advance to today's prices, and then they store it in a damn warehouse because that's the cheapest way to do it. Yeah, I've seen people do the same thing. We've, we've worked with some builders who do that as well. We're like, well, how are you going to get these things? He's like, we already have it. <laughs> like, okay, I mean, that is such a relief right there just to know that. Uh, what's the, I mean, yeah, I know you've highlighted numerous things here, but I, I sometimes like to ask, especially about specific asset classes like this. I mean, what's the biggest risk, you know, a past investor needs to know about other than maybe, you know, not being able to get materials? Uh, you know, what, what's something else maybe they should know or consider when they're investing in a hotel conversion? Yeah, I mean, the biggest risk is at the end of the day, it's execution risk on the, on the, on the construction, right? I, I don't know how else to put it. Yeah. Depending on your comfort level, I want to see more reserves, right? It's one of the risk mitigating strategies. So as long as the budget uh, can sustain that service, typically these projects have leverage. So if you capitalize the project with enough reserves or the sponsor says, listen, you know, the reserves are light but we are communicating upfront that there may be a capital call to investors and this thing may take longer, right? So just the financial ability to sustain the project for longer risk is an important risk. What else? Well, on that note, I agree. Reserves are so important to us as well. Do you have a, a certain amount or, or a way to calculate an amount that you like to see, Mike, before partnering on a project? So specifically, it's a great question, by the way, Whitney. We were looking at a ground-up construction project and, uh, in Phoenix. And to make a long story short, developer was so excited, motivated, confident, comfortable with the 24-month cycle on a basically mini subdivision development. And when we looked at the project, we basically said, you got to have at minimum six to 12 months of additional reserves. So as crazy as it sounds, but I'd like to see the project being able to survive without 
going back to investors for six to 12 more months because of the delays today. It may be longer. It really depends on the complexity, right? For the project we're doing in New York, we think we can bang it out in three years, but we are really aiming conservatively for four years. Why? Because it may take an extra year. There's no right or wrong number, but a year worth of interest reserves, a year worth of uh, reserves is a, you know, it, to me, it feels good today, but I don't, you know, otherwise you, you get really conservatively, you get over conservative and then your return starts getting diluted. Sure. So six to 12 months of reserves is, is, a, is a pretty decent number. Yeah, I, I love that. And I often will sometimes hear one to two months, you know, of operating expenses. And that makes me a little nervous, honestly. Oh my God, I, one I just, to two months? Yeah, that's that's skinny. That is very skinny. I'm not okay with that. Uh, they may show those big returns, but whew, you know, I'm not going to be able to sleep very well, right? So anyway, I love that number though. We, we, we love at least six to nine months and 12 months would be uh, just amazing. Mike, you know, a few final questions. Uh, you know, what's your best source right now for meeting and finding new investors? So investors is, is, is folks with capital, people who invest in the deals. Right. Yeah, it's a relational capital. There's really no, no better way to put it. You have to, you know, we raise most of our capital from referrals and membership tribes that are basically kind of private invitations. And it's it's not, it, not a solicited, you know, we're not marketing heavily out there. So, you know, we raise a lot of capitals from a group of dentists, so, you know, some of the folks you, you, you know, Freedom Founders. We raise number of uh, cal- investments from other similar organizations, their relational tribes. We have a tribe out of Australia that's been investing with us. That's all doing a membership also for folks that achieve financial freedom. Just different. These work a whole lot better than uh, mm-hmm. trying to, you know, cold sell being yeah. a real market. So you get inside of a tribe and build some relationships and add some value ultimately, right? That's right. You serve the community and then they get to know, like, and trust you. I don't know how people can invest with you if they don't know, like, and trust you. So somehow right. you've got to be open. You got to make the people feel like you're accessible and you're serving the community over time. You'll get that. Mike, what, what are some daily habits that you're disciplined about that have helped you achieve success? I try to exercise, although it's not a perfect habit, but for me, you know, during COVID, we've all kind of suffered quite a bit from not being able to get back and, and work out at least now, trying to exercise regularly. <laughs> I do Taekwondo. I spend years doing it. And the one of the, if, if I can't go to the class, I'm, I'm trying to stretch. At least minimum, just uh, one healthy exercise is to... Uh, the other thing is another really important habit is kind of working with a coach. No matter who you are, you, you, you could always use a coach. To have a fitness coach that you know, we track the eating habits, the food, the the apps, the, the my fitness pal. So a little bit of that, no matter what you do, whatever is your business, also make sure you balance it out with a little bit of that trying to take care of better care of yourself. And the other thing is if you have kids, and I have kids, I, said, you know, I have four kids, four monkeys and a cat, my wife, four monkeys and a cat. But yeah, I, I, I try to talk to my kids just to make sure that, yeah, that they don't get too, too disengaged. We're very busy. So I'll have a conversation. I drive kids to school. I pick them up, try to talk to them. So I'll, no matter how busy you are, just try to find a little bit of time to get closer with your kids. Love that. I love that answer too. I don't hear that often enough. Just, yeah, uh, spending that time, quality time with your kids. I think you have to be so intentional with that. My wife and I are working on that all the time. I was reading a John Maxwell book just recently. Uh, I think it's good leaders ask great questions, you know, in a, and, and I love that because it's so true. And one of those, uh, one of the parts of the book he talks about was, you know, asking your kids questions, right? And, and one of his, he said, one of his kids one time, he said, or she said, her, one of her favorite parts of things that they do was sitting at the dinner table or where they can ask questions, you know, uh, and, and get answers, right? And so I love that opportunity that or just that you bring up there is being intentional about spending that time. Uh, Mike, how do you like to give back? Sure. I wanted to provide one more comment on that, on that subject before. Please. So uh, my second kid, she's 16. Uh, I'm really actually excited. She's been reading, you know, Reach That Poor Dad and getting involved with some learning a little bit about what I do. And she literally reached out and explained to me, said, what do you do? I really want to understand. I, I really want to invest. And we, I started explaining to her about real estate, the benefits. And I, we spent time talking about depreciation. And she was fascinated. So uh, if you get a chance, if your kids somehow, you know, you're in real estate, just talk to them and explain this. As boring as it sounds, the depreciation, you can actually explain to them, listen, you can make, you know, great investments. You can get good cash flow and the depreciation helps you defer taxes. 
The little things like that can make a difference. How, how do I give back? I serve. I serve my friends. I serve family. I serve people. You know, if you need, if you have a great question, schedule time with me. Go to bigmikecall.com. It's not a very difficult name to remember. Bigmikecall.com. And just book 15 minutes with me. And I can't promise I'll be able to answer your question, but I will try to at least put you on the right path. I do have some coaching students. <laughs> I have bigmikecoaching.com. I'm not selling that because I'm very selective who I coach. But the way I give back is a little bit of thoughts that people have approached asking me about some of the interesting problem. And I may be able to give you in 15 minutes kind of enough of feedback based on my life and business experience might put you on the right path. Mike, always a pleasure to catch up with you. You are definitely a very experienced fund operator and doing an amazing job and always pleasure to learn from you. And and the listeners learn from you as well. I appreciate you sharing about the New York City project and and really going in depth about hotel conversions. It's not something, again, we've talked about on the show too many times. And, and so I did, I love the, that you can break some of those things down for the investors that are listening and also other active operators uh, that are trying to get into that space. I think there's many things that you mentioned that, hey, they're going to, they need to be thinking about and, and learning from you or people like yourself. And so uh, Mike, mention it again. How can people get in touch with you and learn more about you? Sure. So if they want to chat, bigmikecall.com. And then if they want to reach out to learn a little bit about our family of funds. So we have uh, some great educational content on our website. Uh, the easy way to remember is bigmikefund.com. And if you misspell, you forget the D at the end, bigmikefund.com. I promise it's not a kinky site. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital. Making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.